Every day you and I get bombarded with negative news. Just like the body becomes what we eat, the mind becomes what we're putting in. It is important to listen to stories that not only gives you hope, but also inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we're interviewing experts who will break down the solutions to the world's most pressing problems. And I promise you, if you listen to this podcast, you will not only stay informed, but you will also feel more energy in your life. Welcome. The great.com talks with Hey, if you want to help protect and plant earth, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel because great.com is a philanthropic project which are donating 100% of profit to the most effective cause areas like protecting the rainforest or funding climate change technology. And the topic of today is how do we help people out of poverty and homelessness? And to understand more about this, we have invited Klaus Ehlers, who's the CEO of the nonprofit organization Family Promise. So I want to say welcome, Klaus, to this interview. Thank you very much, Spirit. It's great to be on with you. Klaus, um, could you help us understand, like, uh, it's quite straightforward when you talk about poverty and, and homelessness. But one thing that I've learned from doing a lot of these interviews is um, it's not always that easy. Could you help us just clarify what is the problem that we're talking about uh, that you guys are trying to solve? Sure. Um, so Family Promise is a U.S. Um, organization. We're a national organization in the U.S. So we deal very specifically with family homelessness, right? With those families with children that are experiencing homelessness. And uh, homelessness is just itself a symptom of poverty overall. Uh, and when you look at a country like the U.S., which has, of course, such tremendous wealth, it's really shocking the amount of poverty that exists. And we look at it again through the lens of, of children and, and families. But in the U.S., prior to COVID, one in six children was living below the poverty line. And that number has only gone up since COVID because we've seen that there's obviously been tremendous, de tremendous econ economic um, devastation from COVID. Um, and particularly for those who were earning less. You know, it's an interesting dynamic. The people who were in the professional class have suffered far less economically from COVID than those who were in the working class, those who were in poverty or near poverty. Um, but the issue of poverty is, is, is so complex in the States because you've got this large number of people that are experiencing poverty. You have all of these interventions that are done for it that are inadequate. You have these systemic elements that perpetuate poverty. And what people don't think about um, is that there's profound implications long term when you have poverty. You allow so many children in this country to experience poverty. And, and as I said, right, one in six children is below the poverty line in the U.S., which is $21,000 a year for a family, of, um, a family of four. One in 25 children lives in a family that is half below the poverty line. That means an income of $12,000, which is just, you know, that is so out of scale, what you would expect from a wealthy industrialized nation. Um, allowing that to happen has all of these long-term implications, right? When you allow children to experience poverty, they don't graduate high school as much. They don't go to college as much. Um, they're more likely to be incarcerated. Um, they're more likely to have health outcomes, all of which reduce productivity. So you can look at this from the lens of We've got to address poverty and homelessness from a human lens because we don't want people to be suffering. We don't want children to have the instability of housing and, and all of those dynamics. But it is also an incredible societal and fiscal malfeasance to allow so many people to experience poverty because you just end up draining resources out of the community and cutting future production, right? A child, a 12 year old who is in poverty today, who then is unattractive where they may not graduate high school. If you think about the economy of 2030, how far set back are they? And how likely are they to repeat a lot of the challenges of poverty that they grew up with? So it's critically important that we look at this issue nationally and put in the interventions that can inter intercept that so we're not just perpetuating these challenges. And the investment that we need to make is a fraction of the overall cost in terms of lost productivity and all these other interventions when we allow so many children to experience poverty. So that's sort of a, a kind of a, a national framing of the issue. And I can go into a lot of detail about how, how this plays out in different ways. Um, 
Yeah, what I would like to just clarify then, you're saying that poverty today has a price for tomorrow. So it, it actually continues for the whole nation that we have pro poverty in, in the nation. And then I'm hearing that um, one out of six children uh, was living in poverty conditions before COVID. And now that COVID stro stroke in so hard, I guess, what's the situation right now? If you could help us see that. Yeah, there's, you know, there's all kinds of projections, but um, by the end of this year, um, when the, the, there's an, a moratorium from the CDC on evictions done for health reasons, which is great, but it did not mean that people um, got relief from their rent. So you staved off a lot of families getting evicted, but by the end of the year, when that, when that moratorium is lifted, they'll be in arrears, they'll be very likely to be evicted once that's uh, allowed again and um, have significant you know, have significant deficits in their income uh, and be very difficult to find future housing. And that number is anywhere from 32 to 40 million households that are at risk of eviction. Uh, again, overwhelmingly the, the people who are poor uh, because those workers, right, you think about um, what are the jobs that got, got clobbered by COVID? Hospitality industry retail. Um, these are all major sectors that employ hourly workers who don't make a lot, don't necessarily have a college education. That is where most of the job cuts have come. Um, and beyond job cuts, you had a lot of cutback on wages in terms of hours and so on. So if a family was just struggling, right, if they were, uh, you know, if, if you're spending more than 30% of your income on rent, you are considered housing burden, right? You're paying too much of your housing. You have many families that are paying 60 or 70%. So a reduction, a slight reduction in hours can lead to um, the loss of income that can lead to the loss of housing because those margins are so thin. So COVID has amplified all those existing problems. And then you look at the dynamics of you're supposed to, you're supposed to work from home. Well, most people who have um, low paying jobs, hourly jobs are not in a position where they can work from home. And even if they could work from home, they may not have the connectivity that allows them to do that. Plus their children are now having to school from home. Um, and again, if they don't have that connectivity, if they don't have those resources, you're further disadvantaging those children who are not able to access education because everything has to be done remotely. So all of these are compounding factors. And I, the estimates are that we're gonna go from one in six children to one in five children in poverty just this year because of COVID. And that's an increase of millions and millions of children. So that really paints the picture of what we're dealing with here. And what, uh, how, how does the Family Promise fit into that puzzle of, of at least helping to solve this uh, problem? So, you know, as I said, right, we, we deal with this, specifically with the issue of homelessness. Um, and I'll, I'll take a moment here to kind of describe what homelessness means, because I think there's a common perception of homelessness. And if you ask people, you know, what is homelessness, they would show you a picture of a man holding a cup, a sign, uh, on the sidewalk and so on. And that's certainly a portion of the population experiencing homelessness. But about 35% of the people in the United States who experience homelessness are members of families with children. And those families are uh, not panhandling. They're not living on the streets. They are living in their cars. They're paying for their own stays in motels. They're doubled up with friends and family. They're staying in places that are not fit for habitation. They're in shelters. There's a whole gamut of, of ways that families experience homelessness. Uh, and what ends up happening for those families, nobody, is, nobody plans ahead and says, well, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna experience homelessness. Let me take care of all these things, right? You're trying to stave it off. Um, you're trying to get money so that you can keep your housing, you can secure some kind of stable housing. You're trying to keep your family together. A lot of the adults are working. Some are working two jobs. Um, the kids are going to school. They're living very normal lives, but with this constant threat of instability. Uh, they're also in fear of uh, becoming homeless and losing their children. So there's a lot of different, you know, losing their children to, to governmental authorities. So there's a lot of different pressures on families when they're faced with homelessness. So what Family Promise does is we essentially have three approaches to that. Um, our core program is always shelter. So when a family truly has no other option that we're able to provide them with shelter, but we also do a lot of work to try to prevent the homelessness in the first place. So if we can help a family that's falling behind on its rent, uh, make that up um, and, and, and work out a plan so that they can stay in their housing. Or if they become homeless, if we can get them diverted <clears throat> into another living situation so that they do not have to experience homelessness, 
So those are all prevention programs to keep families from experiencing homelessness. And then on the other side of the stabilization programs, so that once families are in housing, how do we keep them there? That's things like uh, employment, um, financial capability, tra transportation, childcare. You know, I think of families, there, there are families, there's many places in the United States where if you had to, if you were a family, and you had to choose between losing your house or losing your car, you would be wiser to lose your house because once you lose your car, you lose your ability to go to work. Uh, you lose your, you know, you lose an asset that you have uh, and you'll, you're going to lose your house anyway. So transportation, for example, is a really major issue in so much of this country because there isn't sufficient mass transit or the existing mass transit isn't co-located where people in poverty live or where they work. So you have to look at that myriad of issues. And there's a, there's a maxim in social services that says you can't solve one problem if you don't solve all the problems. That is our approach. We try to take a holistic approach and identify what, what empowers this family to long-term success. Yes, it's housing, but you know, is it financial capability, budgeting, and so on? Is it securing childcare? Is it getting entitlements? Is it health and wellness? And how do these all play together? Because we are not looking to get families from homeless to housed. We're looking to get them stably housed. We're looking to get them in the position where someday they get that separation from poverty so they are not constantly at that edge um, where every asset they have, every dollar they have has to be spent in some way to, to ensure that they stay housed. Because the, the, you know, as I said earlier, the goal we have is we want to be able to have children have the same future regardless of their background and housing status. So child experience homelessness is eight or nine times more likely to repeat a grade, right? And that's not inherent to the child, it's because of the situation. So if we can get in between that and we can stabilize that family, we want that child to have the same opportunity to graduate high school in the same future that a child who's never experienced homelessness to have. So it's all about building that long-term stability. So if I would quickly summarize, I'm hearing you have three pro three programs which are important in different aspects of people's lives. One would be prevention, one would be shelter, where people actually really need help right now with some kind of home. And then the last one would be stability to help people for long-term success. So, um, Yeah, and exactly. As I perceive Family Promise, one of the strengths that I really... I guess that will be a core strength that you managed to um, attract is so many volunteers helping with this. So you seem to have a lot of volunteers. Uh, tell us more about uh, how does that work? Yeah, and, and I'll actually start with our founding story. So the organization was founded by a woman named Karen Olson, and she worked as a marketing executive uh, for a consumer company uh, in New York, lived in New Jersey. And in the early 80s, she happened to be walking down the street, saw a woman who clearly was destitute and on an impulse bought her a sandwich, went over to give her the sandwich and they ended up having a conversation. And what that illuminated for Karen was that people who are in extreme poverty, people are experiencing homelessness, whether they're singles or whether they're families, also need community, right? They need to be heard, they need to be respected. Um, they need to feel that they have worth. Um, they, they need to, you know, they need to be honored as human beings as all of us are. And that spurred her to create Family Promise because a couple of years later, she learned that the number one reason why the Division of Youth and Family Services in the state of New Jersey was placing children in foster care was not abuse or neglect. It was simply because their moms had become homeless. This is mid 1980s. So when she heard about that, she said, we've got it. You know, we've got to do something about that. And she's she started organizing and she went to the faith community because they had a clear mandate, they had resources, um, and she knew it, it was not going to get solved by the business community, it was not going to get solved by government. And she started organizing them and they ended up coming up with our, our model that was heavily volunteer intensive. And what came out of that was by involving so many volunteers, and volunteers do very simple things, they make a lasagna, they play Uno, they spend the night, they help somebody with their resume, right? Whatever a volunteer can kind of contribute to that. But by involving so many volunteers, first and foremost, it kept the costs down because you didn't have to have a lot of staff. But more importantly, it gave a sense of community. And we would hear, and we still hear all the time, so many families that come through our program say, I had no idea so many people cared. 
And that is just so powerful. And it is such the essence of family promise. So we have more than 200,000 people around the country that volunteer in some way or other. Um, and each one doing their little task adds up to an incredible national movement. We served more than 100,000 people last year. And again, it was driven by the, the, the passion, the compassion, um, the resources, the ingenuity, the dedication of all of these volunteers. And Spirit, I'll add this to it. So, right, the volunteers, are, there's a cost efficiency, there's this incredible sense of community, but at the same time also, when you're talking about homelessness, you're talking about poverty, you're talking about what causes that, right? And what can we do about those causes? And by engaging so many volunteers, we're actually mobilizing them to think about the issues and act on them. And so I'll give an example. If you have a bus that runs until eight o'clock at night in a, in a suburban community, the moms who work at the mall get off work at nine o'clock at night. So they can't take that bus. So they've got to get an Uber, they got to do childcare arrangements, right? These are, these are um, you know, working poor moms. The, the people in that community don't take that bus. They, they have no connection to it. They don't care if the bus runs past eight o'clock or not. But once they get involved with family problems and they understand how hard these families are working, how unjust it is that families can experience homelessness to the degree that they do in the United States, um, they get energized, they get mobilized, and now they care about when does the bus run. And they can lean in and say, okay, let's get these buses running late enough so these moms can take the buses back and save time and money and be, and be present for their children more. And that's just a micro example, but that goes around affordable housing, it goes around childcare, it goes around things like um, tenant blacklisting. If, if you got evicted 15 years ago and you live in New Jersey, the landlord can do a background check on you, see that you got evicted 15 years ago and deny you housing. Now, if you, if you declared bankruptcy 15 years ago, that's wiped off your record. If you didn't even get evicted, but you simply had a case against your landlord because they weren't providing heat, right? You had a legitimate complaint against your landlord, that still shows up in your record. And that new landlord is gonna say, oh, you went to housing court, I'm not gonna rent to you. So we can mobilize volunteers to become advocates and take a look at issues like that and pressure their legislators to change those rules. So that's the power of the volunteer network. It is the empathy and compassion. It is the service, but it's also this advocacy. You really give justice to the power of volunteers um, hearing that uh, it's not about that single hour. It, it's about also not like it's of course, but the impact that that has for so many people being part of homelessness, including in, in understanding the problem. And I'm guessing that being homeless, if I would put myself in that position, just getting that support one hour when probably I would feel quite lonely and maybe not feeling that that many people care, I guess that would be from that perspective so much bigger uh, than um, if I'm not in a very exposed position, when, when someone says, I'm going to give you one hour, maybe it doesn't mean that much, but when you're exposed, it means a lot. Uh, that's what I'm just assuming. Being... And, and, and it's reciprocal, right? So the, the volunteers, the, the families gain so much for the connection to the volunteers. And it's, you have these long standing relationships between families in our program and families that volunteered for years afterwards. It is, as those families are in their own housing is successful. You, know, you build these really powerful human bonds, but the volunteers will tell you, I get more out of this than the families do. Now that I think is not technically true, but the fact that they feel that speaks to how powerful it is, the experience of volunteering. So you, 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 cannot, you, know, you cannot put a value uh, on this volunteer engagement. Brings you to humanity, uh, being human, uh, that volunteer work. Yeah, I can see that. Um, thank you for taking time to clarify the, um, uh, the, the problem, the, um, how family promise fits into the puzzle. Uh, I would like to end this going to the direction where what do you want people to do or read more about or um, what kind of support do you guys need? Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you for asking that. And I'll, I'll kind of classify it in a couple of different areas. The, the first most simple thing is we're talking about family homelessness specifically, right? If we're talking about family homelessness, we're talking about homeless children. And the Department of Education counts the number of children that experience homelessness in the United States. And one out of 16 children in the United States will experience homelessness in some form or other by the time they are six years old. 
So if you visualize a kindergarten classroom with 16 kids in it, on average, one of those children will have experienced homelessness at some point or other before they move on to the first grade. That is a shocking and horrible statistic. And I think part of the challenge is because family homelessness is invisible, right? I, I've had people come to me and say, I'm really excited to get involved, involved with family problems because I've never met a homeless family before and I, I really want to help. And I appreciate their spirit on that. However, they have met countless homeless families because they have been to McDonald's. They have been to Little League games. They have been in schools, right? Homeless families are everywhere, but they don't have big neon signs over their head saying, we're a homeless family. And so people don't understand the magnitude of the issue. So the first request I would make of everybody is learn about the issue. Right? You can go to our website. You can go to you know, various websites that really talk about the issue of family homelessness and key in on that statistic, right? One out of 16 children experiencing homelessness in some form or other, whether it's staying in a motel, you know, because mom's in between housing and she's paying 80% of her income for a, a motel, living in a shelter, sleeping in the back of the, the car, um, doubled up with friends and family, like sleeping on their porch, Whatever it is, one out of 16 children experiences that by the time they are six years old. We cannot allow that to be. So if we key in on that statistic, then we say, what can we do? What are the actions that we can take? And the, the, the first action is obviously find out what's going on in your community. What are ways you can get involved? Family Promises in 200 communities, we absolutely want you to get involved, get involved as a volunteer. Um, and we, we like to say this, you're qualified to be a volunteer if you can do one of these three things eat, sleep, or talk. If you do all three, even better, right? So you can volunteer. Um, and then absolutely look at ways that you can contribute either in-kind resources or contribute money because critical to everything we do, it does not happen in a void. It's not simply like, okay, here's a family. We're gonna give you some food and you're, you're going to then get your housing. It takes extensive case management, it takes extensive community relations to be able to build those pathways the families can go down to get them to long-term stability. So that requires case management staff, that requires making connections, requires having a place where families can do their resumes, where they can um, take showers, where, you know, where, where they can stay, all of those different elements. So we need awareness, we need volunteerism, and we need funding and in-kind resources. And so I would ask people to look at how they can do those things with Family Promise, but also just with any organization in your community that's addressing family homelessness, because this is one of the most serious issues in this country that the, the, the level of the issue, let me go ahead and go, okay, the level of the issue is this high and the level of the awareness is this high, right? We need to make those match because then we can really take some, some action to solving it. Mm. Thank you for taking the time to clarify. Um, this issue and just understand um, um, the gap that we're facing, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, I'll I'll just I'll add one more. I'll just add, add one anecdote just to sort of illustrate this. And it comes from our one of our affiliates in California. Um, so there was a family uh, had a young a young man, um, sixteen years old or so. Uh, he would have been first in his family to go to college. Very smart kid. He wanted to become a math teacher uh, because he wanted to be able to essentially help other, um, you know, under-resourced um, and disadvantaged populations be able to achieve. And um, he's experiencing homelessness. He signs up for the SAT, right, which you need to take if you want to go to college. Um, but when he shows up to take his SAT test, uh, he can't prove his address because he's homeless. So as much as we sort of think, hey, you know, it's a meritocracy. There are built-in systemic issues that punish people for poverty and homelessness that keep them from being able to achieve. Now, fortunately, our affiliate was able to step in, get him, get him, you know, a, a, a an opportunity at the test. He was able to take that SAT and then go on and go to college uh, and so on. Um, but there are so many systemic issues here that people need to realize it's not just as simple as doing one thing. We've got to look at the whole systems. We've got to understand how much we penalize people for experiencing poverty and homelessness.